You saw what happened yesterday. All the talk about how my Build Back Better plan was going to increase inflation, going to cause these debts and all the like. What happened? Goldman Sachs and others said, if we don't pass Build Back Better, we're in trouble because it's going to grow the economy. Without it, we're not going to grow. And what happened? Stock prices went way down. It took a real dip. Uh huh. Today is Tuesday, December 21st. This is a recap for the stock market activities today. Folks, I got a good one for you tonight. And let's start by this. The market is reacting exactly as we expected. We were expecting a bounce. We got a bounce. And yes, the bounce was more aggressive and more inclusive than I originally thought. But again, the bounce was led by the losers. The biggest gainers today were names like DraftKings, the ARK Invest ETF, Robinhood, names that were severely beaten. And these names managed to outperform the winners, even though a lot of the winners also rallied today. It was the tide that lifted all boats. So what happens from this point on? Well, we have two trading days left, and the assumption is the majority of the selling was already done, and therefore the path of least resistance is higher. However, do not expect gains like we saw today. The gains will moderate, yet a lot of these losing stocks have a lot more juice to squeeze. But do not expect gains of 10%, 7% in a day. You're not going to see that anymore. The gains will moderate, but you can still ride on the oversold rally for these stocks. Anyhow, let's move on to In Focus tonight. Let's revisit the wall of worry and the items we have. Number one, the chaos in DC. Number two, the threat from Russia and natural gas prices. Number three, the Pokemon variant. Number four, China. And number five, perhaps the most important item in the wall of worry is the hawk. We start with the brothel over at DC. And of course, by now you are aware the Build Back Better is dead. Although the president came out today and gave a glimpse of hope that perhaps he will renegotiate with Manchin. Senator Joe Manchin, a.k.a. Maserati Manchin. And let's pause here. Let me say something. One thing I admire about Trump is he brought the war to the backyard of any of his opponents. Meaning somebody from the Republican Party who opposes Trump's agenda. Well, Trump will go to his backyard and rally a crowd in that particular senator or congressman's backyard in his home state and he will brand them give them nicknames that will stick and he destroyed many politicians within his own party just because they opposed his agenda now the democrats are spineless of course they're not going to do any of that can you imagine biden going to west virginia gathering a rally and calling mansion maserati mansion maserati mansion maserati mansion because that's what's going to work but of course he's not going to do that because who's going to attend his rally anyways? Five people? Half of them thought they're taking the bus to the casino. But anyways, just a disclaimer here. I am not a fan of Build Back Better. I criticized it over and over and over again. Matter of fact, I called it the Build Back Better scam. And the reason is it has the salt cap deductions raised and this is a gift to the rich and many other flaws within that bill. Yet, there are good elements. There are elements that are needed within that bill. And Manchin killed the bill. We ask Americans across the board, doesn't matter which affiliation you are, blue, red, or anything between. We ask, is it acceptable in this country for folks to pay higher prescription drug prices than other nations? You pay an arm and a leg for prescription drugs. Is this acceptable? Is having affordable prescription drug prices a good idea or a bad idea? The majority of you will say it is a good idea. Unless, of course, you got dropped in your little head when you're a baby. Likewise, when we ask Americans, is it acceptable in this country for folks to go bankrupt because they had to undergo an emergency operation, a medical procedure? Is it acceptable for folks to go bankrupt due to medical emergencies? Of course not. No rational human being can think that. Likewise, when we talk about folks, average folks, poor, middle class, who are burdened, by the insane cost of child care due to inflation. Inflation that they had nothing to do with. The inflation was started by the Fed and the recklessness of their policies. The shutdown that caused labor shortages 
and folks to quit, causing that shortage in child care personnel. Is this the fault of parents, the poor, the middle class? Of course not. So shouldn't we help those families with the cost of child care? Of course, yes. No reasonable person would say no. So why did Maserati Mansion kill the bill. By doing so, Goldman Sachs says the GDP growth will slow down. Now ask yourself a question, is this good for the stock market or not? Of course it's not. The pumpers say, don't worry about the stock market, yes, the Fed is not going to be accommodative, yada yada yada, but growth is still intact. Well, Goldman Sachs now says growth is not intact. Why? Because we were dependent on the coke from the Fed and the coke from the fiscal policy. And now we got cut from both. But why did Maserati Mansion kill the bill? The answer is, he looks down on you. He thinks you're a bunch of animals. Matter of fact, he thinks that parents are using the child tax credit payments to buy drugs. Meanwhile, here are the facts. The majority of the money, the child tax credit, 59% of that money goes on food expenses. We have a crazy inflation in this country that is burdening poor and middle class families. When you give them extra money, they're spending it on food, utilities, rent, mortgage, essentials. When you give families who don't need that credit this money, of course they're going to spend it on drugs, yoloing stocks, cryptos, and buying stuff they don't need. But we're talking about families who need the money. Maserati Mansion says... It's a no-go for me. This is too much spending here. And of course, the real reason for the opposition is Maserati Mansion wants to save money for his donors, the super rich. Because within this bill, yes, the coastal elite will benefit from the rise in salt cap deductions. However, the bill also raises taxes on corporations and the ultra-wealthy by a little bit. And of course, we told you before, the rich said, not a penny more. We're not going to pay a penny more. And of course, luckily, they have a hooker in the brothel working for them. When you really think about it, how the hell does a senator, a setting U.S. senator, on a senator's salary can afford $5,000 custom-made Brioni suits? How the hell does he afford a Maserati and many other luxury cars? How does he afford a yacht, a massive yacht, private jets? How does Maserati Mansion afford all of these luxuries? The answer is selling his soul to the rich. And this is the broken system, the brothel that we're living in. And if you thought that was obscene, just to illustrate for you how the rich look down upon you as animals not worthy of a penny more. Listen to this exchange between Kevin O'Leary and Anthony Scumbagamushi. Kevin O'Leary is such an evil person, he made Scumbagamushi look like the good guy. Take a listen. Well, listen, I mean, gridlock is very good for the markets. Kevin is right about that. Uh, but I think you got a real problem in the country between the haves and have nots, Joe. And if you look at the child care scarcity and the child care shortages and you look at the issue that we have to deal with with the environment, I think we got to pass a bill. And I and I will say this to Kevin and other Wall Street participants. We've grown the Fed balance sheet five trillion dollars in the last 21 months. And yet, when you think about what we're doing for middle and lower income people, uh, I don't think we're there yet. And I think we need to have more legs on the stool. And so hopefully they'll get back uh, to the legislative process and pass something that will help middle and lower income people. Uh, and, and listen, it's great for me. I don't have to pay extra taxes as a result of this. Uh, it's probably good for the markets. Kevin is probably also right about the gridlock being good for the markets, but I'm just talking about not left or right, but what's right or wrong for the country. We need to get things passed to help the middle and lower income people in our society. What about that, Kevin? What's right for the country and every participant in it, whether you're at the top of the economic echelon or the bottom, is a very strong, buoyant economy that's competitive globally. And the Biden proposals on how to pay for this is one of the reasons this bill died. Even the New York Times called it chaos. But the idea of taking the country from the middle of the G20 in terms of taxation, both for individuals and corporations, and putting it right to the top. In other words, people in New Jersey, New York, and I've sent this countless times, Massachusetts and California, would not only be the highest taxed people on Earth, the companies that employed them would be the highest taxed on Earth. That just is a recipe for disaster. That doesn't help anybody. And in the long term, destroys the economy. So I'm very happy that this thing is dead. And I think it's good for everybody. Now, look, I, I, I agree with Anthony. There's disparity, but there's always been disparity in a, in a capitalist society. And if you don't like it, there's other options. 
And they're not places anybody wants to go to. And here's the thing, folks. They say, oh, what is this, socialism? You don't like it? You don't like capitalism? Find another country. This is a capitalist system. We like capitalism. Let me ask you a question. Is this really capitalism or is it gangsterism and oligarchy? Because folks like O'Leary and Manchin did not complain at all. When the Fed printed trillions of dollars, we're almost at nine trillion dollars in the Fed's balance sheet. Trillions of dollars propping up equity prices higher. To benefit who? To benefit the rich. When you really think about it, the stock market is just a vehicle of transferring wealth from the poor and the middle class to the rich. Because they use these trillions of dollars to prop up equities prices higher. To benefit who? To benefit the rich. The rich dumps at the top, realizing all of these gains, turning fake money to real money, and they leave the poor and the middle class holding the bag. This is, in essence, socialism for the rich. But you didn't hear Kevin O'Leary or Manchin complaining about that. They complain after the fact, after they already dumped at the top. Then they complain. They say the Fed has to be responsible, yada, yada, yada. So how much does this child care tax credit cost? Must be trillions of dollars, right? Here are the facts. The child tax credit will cost $190 billion in this bill. And if it is trimmed to exclude families making over $100,000 or $120,000, whatever they decide, $75,000, the cost will go tremendously down. Think about it. They're complaining about $190 billion, but they had no problem whatsoever when the Fed printed trillions of dollars. And this money, by the way, is stolen from the next generation of Americans. There is no such thing as free lunch. All of this money racked up from the public debt will bite us in the ass sooner or later. But Kevin O'Leary, Senator Manchin, and the likes have no problem with that whatsoever because it is socialism for the rich. Steal from the poor and the middle class and hand that money to the rich. Mind you, the rich and the billionaires looted, keyword looted, the Treasury Department and the country's money. They stole billions of dollars from the PPP loans program. Nobody sounded the alarm here. Nobody complained whatsoever. Why? Because this is what they mean by capitalism. And then you wonder why folks at Time Magazine say, if the economy is doing so well, why does it feel like a disaster? Because it is a disaster. It is a disaster if you're poor or middle class. It is a disaster if your rent went higher by 15-20%. It is a disaster if you cannot afford a home. It is a disaster when you cannot afford child care. A one parent has to stay at home and not earn an income. But this is a great economy for the rich and the 1%. Folks, this is not capitalism. This is gangsterism. And if it continues, the future will be dire. You know why? Because the guillotine will come back. Those Gen Zers and young millennials that you're stealing from, once they realize that they got robbed once their crypto gains and NFT mania crashes and they realize that they just got scammed, they will get angry because the future is dire for them and this will lead to a revolution and perhaps a civil war. So the rich better wake the f up. This so-called capitalist system is not sustainable. It's going to collapse and it will cause a civil war. This gangsterism system needs to be reformed right now. But back to the wall of worry. Is the DC brothel a problem for the market right now? The answer is yes, because Build Back Better is dead. But that could be revived any time from now. So it is not the major source of worry here. But about Russia and Putin, it is still not the main source of concern here, because for all we know, perhaps Putin is playing games. He wants to score some deals here and there. Yet the situation is alarming. The US says if Russia invades Ukraine, they will start a proxy war against Russia by funding insurgents in Ukraine. This is a dangerous situation, of course. Yet the most important event when it comes to the wall of worry and Russia being an item in the wall of worry is the upcoming vote in January. They cut a deal for now to vote on the pipeline between Russia and Germany. And if the US starts to sanction that pipeline, the natural gas prices will spike significantly higher. And this will add a major concern for the market because it will push inflation higher and higher and therefore enticing a reaction from the Fed, a more hawkish reaction by the Fed to control this inflation. Never mind that Russia could actually retaliate by invading Ukraine, and then we will have natural gas prices spiking higher, and not just natural gas prices, but also crude oil prices will explode higher. If that happens, it will add tremendous pressure to push inflation higher and therefore make the Fed even more hawkish. What about China? What's going on with China here? Are we concerned about China? Of course we are. And the main source of concern when it comes to China is Evergrande and the crackdown from the CCP. 
The crackdown goes on. They're delisting companies from the U.S. exchange. They're cracking down within China on any showing of wealth, the celebrity culture. They have also suspected for so long that they're pressuring companies to disinflate their earnings just to show that these companies are not making massive amount of money while average Chinese citizens suffer. China is a source of concern because we have a lot of U.S. companies who rely on Chinese revenue. And these happen to be the largest companies on the stock exchange. For example, Apple, Starbucks, Nike. By the way, Nike came out yesterday and said that their China revenues are down 20%. And this is a major source of concern because when the geniuses over at Wall Street, the Goldman Sachs of the world say, don't worry about the stock market because corporate earnings are still intact. You know, if the Fed is not accommodative anymore, we can rely on the fundamentals. What a bunch of clowns. How can we rely on the fundamentals if corporate revenues and profits from China are getting hit? If China goes down, the entire global economy will go down with it. China is simply too big to fail. China is panicking right now by injecting $188 billion into the economy. They're collapsing economy. It's a rescue mission right now and there are no guarantees that the rescue mission will succeed. We know for sure now that Evergrande has defaulted. And I told you before, the risk from the default of Evergrande is not actually Evergrande, but when you lift the rock, who are the roaches hiding under that rock? It could be international banks, international lenders, it could be US-based companies, it could be US-based funds, and if these funds blow up, it could be contagious. The experts told us that this is not Lehman. This is way smaller than Lehman. But we now know that this is indeed way bigger than Lehman. Even the Fed warned that if Evergrande defaults, it will be contagious. And we're seeing the dominoes falling here. Not just Evergrande, but pretty much every single real estate developer in China is falling apart. And of course, the Chinese government is trying to pick up the spoils here. But can they continue to bail out all of these companies? Of course not. And now we have entities that holds some cash for these real estate developers in China, be it in an investment form or in a dividend form or a bond payment form, they're bailing out. They know that it's over. The dominoes are falling and therefore they're refusing to pay these companies any cash they owe. We have $313 million disappearing from China developer and this developer is called Fortune Land. Fortune Land has lost contact, quote unquote, with China Create Capital, a British Virgin registered firm to which it handed over $313 million in hopes of receiving an annual return of 7 to 10 percent through 2022. We'll say goodbye to that. They're not paying you back. And as giant real estate developers in China continue to implode, that $188 billion injection into the economy, poof, Gone. Didn't do anything at all. And now the Chinese government is scrambling. And they're doing so by lowering interest rates. What does that mean? The Chinese economy is falling apart. If China goes down, do you really think that the global economy will be just fine? You gotta be delusional to think that. So China remains a major item in the wall of worry. Forget about Russia. Forget about the brothel. China is way larger than these two combined. Now, what about the hawk? Or shall we say the hawks? plural. And the reason is, all of a sudden, all of them are becoming hawks. Why? Because this is the CPI reading. And we are seeing the highest inflation since the 1970s. And by the way, let me fix this one for you. If you remove the manipulation from the formula of the CPI, this is what inflation actually looks like. To the moon higher than the 70s. Why? Look at housing inflation. Look at rent inflation. We have double digit over 20% inflation in rents in pretty much every single American city. Do you really think that the CPI is at 6%? Give me a break. Matter of fact, the CPI says rent inflation went by only 3.9% year over year. And even the king of doves, Fed president from New York, Williams, he came out on Friday. And of course, he sounded absurd because he said, yes, we're going to raise interest rates. The time is appropriate for raising interest rates, but this could be a good thing for the economy. Of course, he tried to use his dove wings for the last time by saying, oh, the Fed is not going to accelerate the taper. That's not going to happen. We're going to end the taper by March. But here's the real concerning element when it comes to the Hawks. It's not the statement from Williams on Friday. It was the statement from Governor Waller was as hawkish as it can get. Matter of fact, Waller said rates could rise as soon as tapering ends in March. 
meaning the first raid could happen as soon as March. This is as hawkish as you can get. Given my expectations for inflation and labor market conditions, I believe an increase in the target range for the federal funds rate will be warranted shortly after our asset purchases end, quote unquote, Mr. Waller said in a speech on Friday, hinting at a rapid path ahead for returning monetary policy to a more normal setting. The decision to wrap up bond purchases sooner, he said, is providing flexibility for other adjustments to monetary policy, if needed as early as spring, to accommodate changes in the economic outlook, quote-unquote. He later clarified that he saw Marsh as potentially live, quote-unquote, meeting for a rate increase. Da -da -da -da. We could be ready for a liftoff in Marsh or May. Mr. Wallace said if his expectations came to pass, he then noted that officials could watch to see how rate increases affected the economy and if inflation slowed as expected later next year, potentially speeding up the pace if price gains remain brisk. Do some hikes. See what the impact is, Mr. Wallace said. Here's the problem with this. They made a mistake with transitory, with being behind the game. Now they could make the opposite mistake of being too aggressive, meaning let's say the economy is slowing down and then they raise rates and see what the impact is. But we know there is a lagging reaction in Fed policy. So let's say they raise rates and inflation continues to rise higher and then they become more aggressive and they raise rates even higher. This could crush the economy and the stock market and this is what the bond market is worried about. When you see the yield curve flattening. This is a message from the bond market saying this could be a policy mistake. Now you know my stance on this. I say perhaps a recession is the remedy for this high inflation. You cannot escape it. You cannot have your cake and eat it too unless it's your birthday. And when we have a coked up economy, a coked up market, at the hint the coke is going away, you would see the withdrawal. And we're already seeing it in the market by the way. Continuing, Mr. Waller's haste came as he voiced concern about inflation, which has risen to the highest level in nearly 40 years, and optimism about growth. Inflation is alarmingly high, persistent, it has broadened to affect more categories of goods and services compared with earlier this year, Mr. Waller said. And here comes the but, 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 but right? We gotta prop up the market. We can't scare the market, right? Mr. Waller is just one of 12 people in the policy setting Federal Open Market Committee, so his view on when interest rates should rise reflects his opinion, rather than standing as a clear signal of what is coming. But he may be giving voice to concerns that are becoming more widely shared among policymakers. This is all bullshit, of course. Here's the thing. The satanic cult at Davos and the World Economic Forum, they get to decide what to do here. And their agenda was inflate everything. And now the agenda says deflate everything, crash everything. Therefore, it doesn't matter if inflation goes higher or lower, they're gonna raise interest rates. They're gonna tighten. It's part of the agenda. When you look at the Fed dots, for example, versus market expectations, the Fed dot plots in yellow and the median in green versus the market expectations in white, or shall we say lavender for the picky people out there, doesn't matter to me. But as you can see, market expectations are not buying the Fed dot plot. They're saying rates are not going to rise as much as the Fed is saying. Now, there could be a lagging reaction where the market is going to wake up at some point and catch up with the Fed's dot plot. The market is still hooked up on the drug, believing that the Fed is just bluffing. They're not going to really raise interest rates. They're not going to taper. They're absolutely delusional of course. When you look at what the rich are doing, hedge funds registered in the Cayman Islands, they have already sold $54 billion in treasuries in October. Ahead of time, of course, conveniently so, because they know they got the memo from the Fed ahead of time. And as you can see, hedge fund positioning for the 10-year, this is for the bond, the 10-year bond, it's going down. As the two-year treasury yield rises higher, Remember, the Fed has control on the two-year yield, not the 10. When the two-year yield moves higher, it means the Fed will start raising interest rates. No doubt about it at all. And of course, the hedge funds, the smart money, is dumping bonds in anticipation of interest rate hikes. Now ask yourself a question. Is this good for the market? Or is it bad for the market? The answer is, you remove the accommodation and the buying of bonds, the Tina argument, and all of a sudden equity prices collapse. Now, what about the Pokemon variant? What is the risk here? It is still confusing. Nobody knows what the shot is. Everybody's confused right now because the WHO came out and said that the Pokemon variant poses very high global risk and the world must prepare. And then came San Fuji and he said, it may not be a big deal, but we should prepare for the worst anyways. And then came Joe Bonanza 
bananas. And he said the unjab should prepare to die. Come on, man. And of course, with about over a year worth of propaganda and demonization of the unjab, one in three Americans believe that we should lock down and restrict the unjab. They're pinning neighbor against neighbor, family member against family member. We have families right now saying, don't show up to Christmas if you're not boosted. This is not based on science whatsoever. You have people who already boosted, case in point, Jim Cramer, who got it anyways. And he attended a party where everybody was tested and boosted, and they got it anyways. And of course, while we criticize Cramer, we wish him a speedy recovery. Then the CDC came out and said the majority of reported cases of the Pokemon happen to be in the fully jammed. And then came the fact from the Imperial College in London, saying that the Pokemon largely evades immunity from the jabs. Then came Fauci again and said there is no need for a new jab for the Pokemon. And then came Pfizer CEO and said, no, we need a new jab for the Pokemon. And he added, if you fill your Pfizer loyalty card and you get your eighth booster, you get a free pizza. And then Fauci came out and said, we might change the fully jab definition to include boosting. And then came the draconian lockdown and the measures, of course. The dictator over in New York is destroying small businesses, fining them $1,000 a day for not following the rules, quote-unquote rules. And we're seeing absolutely insane stories, not warranted at all. For example, a patient was at a care facility suffering from a cardiac arrest. The paramedics refused to get in because the rules say you cannot get in because of the Pokemon variant. Absolute insanity out there. And then you have corporate America losing their mind. Kroger, for example, cut the sick leave and benefits for those who are unjab among their workers. Matter of fact, they added a surcharge to punish the unjabbed among their workforce. And surprise, surprise, Kroger is now panicking. Kroger-owned grocery chains are desperately trying to replace striking workers as employees walk off the job at the height of the holidays shopping season. What a bunch of geniuses, right? Then Boeing came out and said, you know what, since the appeal court struck down the Biden mandate, we're going to drop our mandate on the 10,000 unjabbed Boeing employees. Just a day later, another appeals court reinstated the Biden mandate. Confusion all over the place. And now cases are surging like crazy, even in highly jabbed states like New York, cases are surging like crazy. LA, cases are skyrocketing, even in Rhode Island, highly jabbed state, cases are rising. Princeton and other universities had to cancel classes and move final examinations online due to cases surging, even though all of their student body is already jabbed. Cases are rising in countries that are highly jabbed, like Portugal, for example. The New York Times asks, will high jab rates help Spain wither new variant? And here's the answer. Spain's The Thing infection rate rises to very high risk, quote-unquote, level. Even in the UAE, a highly jabbed country, cases are rising by the most in a long time. Even Denmark. Highly jabbed country, also asking, what's going on here? We thought we're out of the woods, we get the jabs, and we're done. Well, clearly, we now know it is not as simple as that. And then we have the South African doctor who discovered the Pokemon variant, saying the world's response is unfair. They're going crazy. And then I was watching Ship on CNBC, and he was interviewing the CDC chief, and this is what she said. Absolute insanity. <laughs> exactly as you say it may not prevent infections and so what we really do need to do is make sure that people who continue to be vaccinated and boosted continue to wear their masks to prevent the infections overall so the bottom line is there is confusion all over the place we have no idea what's going on here we have no idea what to believe and this is costing the global economy a dire cost we're talking about china collapsing on top of that we have lockdowns in many other countries economic restrictions. Yes, this could be good for inflation, but who knows, because inflation is sticky. It could continue to rise even though the pace of economic activity is slowing down globally, thus the phenomenon of stagflation. And the impact of this confusion is clearly seen in the stock market. One day you see cruises and airlines popping higher. The next day they're crashing. And we have this massive volatility up and down, depending on the news from the Pokemon variant. So to clear all of this confusion, I decided to call Dr. Fauci myself. Take a listen. Hey, Dr. Fauci, pleasure to have you in the program. Good to be with you, Chuck. No, 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 I'm not Chuck. That was uh, Sunday on NBC. But anyways, you are in the Maverick of Wall Street, YouTube. Did you get your booster? No, I was at Costco over the weekend, and the line was insane, so I decided to bail out. Well, you're gonna die. No, I'm not. I looked at the death risk for my age group, 
you know, the graphs, I have a better chance of dying from slipping on a banana peel. Well, you might have a fever. Maybe, but should we close the whole world and destroy the economy because I have a fever? What do you have against science, Senator Poole? Oh, I forgot. You're the Pope of Science, and criticizing you is blasphemy. The Pope of Science. I like that. So what's going on with the Pokemon variant? The jabs are not working as expected, huh? Well, you see, Maverick, we have over 60 million Americans who are eligible to be vaccinated who are not vaccinated. And we have about 100 million Americans who are eligible to be boosted who are not boosted. Okay, stop, stop, stop. Just stop. The propaganda line that you keep repeating every time I see you on TV. You repeat the same garbage. What do you have against science, Senator Poole? Well, doing the same thing, expecting different results, is the definition of insanity. What if the 60 million get jabbed? The virus will still circulate in other countries and mutate, wouldn't it? Well, that is a good point you make there. And? Well, I'm going to pretend I never heard that. But if everyone gets vaccinated, they will be protected. No, they're not, because the protection wanes and there is no way to track it. So they should get the booster. So how many boosters are we going to get? Oh, about 5 million. Well, that sounds to me like a subscription service to Pfizer. Exactly. How do you suppose they'll make money on my Pfizer calls? Did you see what happened today? Fucking brutal. Down 50%. Ah, now we're talking. This is what it's all about, isn't it? It's all about the money, baby. Of course. How do you suppose they'll pay for my yacht, the Stugats? I don't know, Doc. Maybe you're buying calls at the top. I covered the Pfizer chart a couple of days ago. It doesn't look good to me. Well, we'll make it look good. If Pfizer calls don't print, I'll be fired. What about Moderna? You like that? No, Chuck. That was last year's trade. Now it's buy Pfizer, short Moderna. Buy Pfizer, short Moderna? Buy Pfizer, short Moderna. Oh, and I meant to ask you, what cryptos should I buy? Bitcoin or Ether? I don't know, Doc. I'm not a tulip expert. Maybe you should go with uh, Shiba. You should buy the dip in Shiba. But anyways, it was good talking to you. Thank you for the transparency. Okay. Don't forget to get your boost there. Anyhow, folks, this was a nice trip, the Wall of Worry. And now that that's out of the way, let's move on to cover the market, starting with the performance. And here we go. The Dow Industrial Average closing in the green, up 560.54 points or a gain of 1.60%. The Nasdaq closing in the green by 360.14 points or a gain of 2.40%. The S&P 500 also in the green, closing up 81.21 points or a gain of 1.78%. What about the sector's performance today? Well, we have every single sector of the market closing in the green, led by consumer cyclicals and capturing the gold medal. And Number two for the silver, technology. Number three for the bronze, energy. The laggards of the day, the defensives, consumer defensives, utilities, and healthcare. Today was a risk on Canada Day. The rebound, the tide that lifted all boats. What about the advance to decline ratios? The NYSE, 85% advancing versus 12% declining. The NASDAQ, 75% advancing versus 20% declining. Now, just like when we see exaggerated ratios to the downside, we say it is always, almost always, an indicator that we will see a pop or a rebound. When we see exaggerated numbers to the upside, we see a retreat. That doesn't mean that the stock market will trade down tomorrow, but the ratios will normalize, getting closer to the 50-50 line. What about futures? What's going on here? Crude oil prices are rebounding significantly higher, erasing all of the losses from yesterday. The WTI closing in the green by almost 4%. Brent closing also in the green almost by 3.5%. Likewise, we have gains for gasoline, heating oil, and natural gas. Natural gas being the laggard, yet we have some tailwinds here. Remember the previous forecast that we talked about a few weeks ago? When they came out and said that this winter would be warmer than expectations due to El Nino or whatever. And I said back then that this forecast is bullshit because the intent from releasing such a forecast is to drop natural gas prices, lower inflation expectations, and therefore prop up the stock market higher. What do you know? We now have a new forecast and it appears that this winter will be colder than expectations. What does that mean? Natural gas prices 
should move higher. Matter of fact, natural gas prices in European markets are surging way out of whack and prices are moving higher and higher and higher. Even in India, futures prices have been rising significantly higher, adding to inflation, and therefore the Indian authorities, as a final resort, <laughs> decided to manipulate the market by halting futures trade, specifically in farm commodities. Here's the problem, folks. If you are in India listening right now, what really matters is the United States futures market trading in the US, because when the US sneezes, you're gonna catch AIDS. It doesn't matter what happens in the futures market in India because commodities are traded in the US dollar. Likewise, fertilizers prices are surging out of whack in Europe, specifically in the UK. And therefore, one corner of the market that doesn't get a lot of attention is fertilizers. Names like Corteva, Mosaic, Nutrin, all of these are good stocks, specifically at this stage of the stock market. But back to the futures. What about softs? We have declines for lumber, erasing some of the latest gains, yet lumber futures are trading above 1,000. The price is more than doubled since the bottom. Likewise, we have OJ retreating by a little bit, closing at the flat line. It was down big in the morning, but they bought the dip in OJ. Interesting action today. I've already added this trade, yet they're buying the dip in OJ. Perhaps there is more juice to squeeze here. On the other hand, we have gains led by coffee, cocoa, cotton, and sugar futures. What about metals? Gold is staying flat for the day. Meanwhile, we have gains for silver, platinum, copper, and palladium. The dollar pretty much in the flat line, but the second enemy of gold, the 10 year yield, moved higher today. What about meats? We have gains across the board led by lean hog surging higher by almost 4% today. And then we have modest gains for both live and feeder cattle futures. What about grains? Gains across the board. Soybean, soybean meal, soybean oil, corn, wheat, rough rice, oats, canola, all closing in the green. So whatever the Indian authorities did, apparently it did not work. Moving on to the big casino, the options market, what's going on here? The volume is receding as expected, of course. We have a holiday shortened trading week, so you're not going to see those massive moves pushing equities higher via buying call options. Yet a number one, the hottest table by far, is Apple with a little over 1.3 million contracts. About 76% of those were calls. And at number two, Tesla, the souffle, with almost 700,000 contracts traded today. About 58.5% of those were calls. And here it is at number three, the ticker MO for Alteria Group, for tobacco, of course. The name is paying dividend tomorrow, and therefore they're selling calls, a lot of calls here. This is typical behavior. It means that the stock will likely trade down tomorrow. About half a million contracts traded today, 90 8% of those were calls. Moving on to the unusual activities that took place in the options market today, starting with the ticker JETS Jets. This is the airline ETF. They're buying calls even though the charts don't look good at this point. But anyhow, they bought the 23 calls for the expiration date, February 18th, with the expectations that Jets could pop higher. By more than 9% by then, they paid about 66 cents apiece, the end of the trade, all in all, spending about $3 million. And what about the ticker UNG for natural gas? They're buying puts, interesting given the facts that we just covered. In this case, they're buying the 11 bucks calls for the, excuse me, puts for the expiration date, February 18th, with the expectations. The natural gas UNG could drop down by more than 12% by then. They paid about 55 cents apiece to enter this trade, all in all spending about half a million dollars. What about the trade for the ticker TQQQ? This is the leverage index for the NASDAQ the triple Qs. They're buying puts here with two days till expiration, the 143 puts, the expiration date, this upcoming Thursday, December 23rd, with expectations that the name could drop down by more than 8%. They paid about $350,000. What about the trades for the ticker? XBI, this is the biotech ETF. This is a call spread. They're buying the 129 calls and they're selling the 138 calls, all for the expiration date, February 18th, with the expectations that the XBI could pop higher by more than 10% by then, but not more than 18%. They paid about two bucks and 30 cents a piece for buying the 129 calls and they received in credit about 90 cents a piece from selling the 138 calls and that brought the average 
to one buck and 40 cents a piece all in all spending about one million dollars and what about the ticker xrt this is for the retail etf they're buying puts here the 82 puts for the expiration date february 18th with the expectations that the xrt will suffer more pain by the tune of over six and a half percent by then they paid about three bucks a piece to enter this trade all in all spending about one million dollars and before we move on we have a lot of questions when we cover the unusual activities how do you know if this trade is a buy or a sell it doesn't matter for each trade there is a buyer and then there is a seller but usually not always but usually buying triggers the selling and therefore we cover it from the buyer's perspective moving on to the heat map analysis what's going on here it is a sea of green the tide that lifted all boats with very few exceptions of course the recent winners are lagging we're talking about avgo broadcom oracle adobe even apple gaining almost two percent yet lagging the massive gains of the recent losers this was a pop led by the losers the names that are oversold bounced significantly higher higher and the sustainability of the bounce in my opinion of course will be in the losing names because you're going to have more short covering more profit taking and more oversold bounces the names that are not oversold these bounces could be transitory we're talking about the big caps we're talking about the recent winners of course the notable decliner today was pfizer pfizer down big we covered the chart just a couple of days ago and it looked toppy then so what you're seeing right now it's not due to the variant or virus news it is due to the technicals here. They're dumping some of the winners, the high runners, and they're buying the dip in the recent losers. Moving on to charts, starting with SPY, 30 minutes chart. What's going on here? We were anticipating a pop in the morning and we got it. The market opened higher, gapping higher. It did not close the gap though. It popped higher and it reversed in the first hour of trading before closing the gap. We actually saw names, big cap names like Apple and Tesla trading in the red, erasing all of the gains from the pop in the morning and that was enough to suck a lot of shorts in the trade which explains the exacerbated move that we saw in the market today because there was a lot of short covering from those who got suckered in the morning those who rushed to short the market prematurely here's your hint you should have known right away that the market will trade higher not lower today we had the gap and crap then the market stopped before closing the gap below and it started to trade higher this is always always a bullish indicator and it says the market is not ready to close the gap below matter of fact it wants to trade higher it wants to close the gap above but perhaps climb another target and this target is 461 it was resistance now support now where do we go from here look at the rsi it's getting overbought the pop was extreme today what does that mean in all likelihood we could see a pullback or consolidation to work out those overbought conditions you have to understand this is a shortened trading week it's a holiday week we have a lower volume the path of least resistance is higher but let's say the market opens gapping higher again in the morning i will dump right away because the indicators will be extremely overbought and the algos will dump either way the support for now is 461 resistance at 466 and a half which also coincides with another gap above what about the daily chart for the continuous contract and the spy again we're seeing a pop higher the momentum indicators are strengthening not by much the volume is receding all of these are good signs for the bulls and what is the target here from the pop 4657 it wants to go there and retest that level i wouldn't get too excited here assuming that this is the bottom because we will see more pain to come after the holiday week but for now the assumption is the chart should go ahead and retest 4657 for support what about the cues 30 minutes chart what's going on here it gapped higher in the morning and we saw the gap and crap before closing the gap above this is a bearish sign yet the bears the shorts got sucked in again assuming we will have a flush down what do you know the cues closed the gap below and reversed higher again and those shorts had to cover along with other shorts who were taking profits and therefore you're seeing this massive vertical ratty higher in the nasdaq we are now trading within the support zone the assumption is look at the rsi indicator way overbought we should see a pullback or consolidation at least to work out these overbought conditions what about the daily chart for the continuous contract in the nasdaq the important number was 15,975. you can make that 976 doesn't matter to me but the q's futures closed above that number for the day the momentum indicators are strengthening not by much look at the volume 
cooling off. All of these are good signs for the bulls, yet the macro formation remains bearish. We have a head and shoulder formation, we have a negative divergence from both the RSI and the MACD, and we have yet to have a confirmation that 15,975 is solid for support. Moving on to the IWM, what's going on here? 30 minutes chart. Again, a gap higher. Unlike the SPY and the Qs, there was no gap in crap. There was a little bit of a crap in the first 30 minutes, but it was clear that airlines, cruises, travel names were picked up quickly. They were buying the dip, they were buying the dip in the small caps, and therefore the IWM outperformed today, and it closed right at the resistance of 218. But look at where the RSI is trading, overbought. What does that mean? We should see a pullback or consolidation to work out these overbought conditions. What about the Dixie? Daily chart, what's going on here? Nothing at all, just consolidating for now, waiting and waiting and waiting. The trading in the currency market is slowing down. Yes, we're seeing massive moves in the Turkish lira, for example, but the impact is so small from the lira alone. You need the yen, you need the Australian dollar, the euro, perhaps the sterling to move higher or lower to initiate that reaction from the US dollar. For now, the dollar is not doing anything at all trading within range, support of 96, resistance of 97. And if the dollar is trading flat, then gold is also trading flat. Although perhaps forming a bull flag formation here, too early to say, but I'm still liking gold here. The setup is good for gold. The two enemies are still here, the dollar and the 10 year, but we're seeing legitimate rush to safety. Yes, we're gonna see these massive pops in the market, the rebounds, but the sentiment has changed and we're looking for true safety in gold. Here's a chart for the 10 year year what's going on here the first thing i notice is the momentum indicators and they are strengthening they're crossing from negative divergence to positive divergence and on top of that the 10-year yield knocked at the door of one and a half percent it did not close quite there but when we look at the behavioral element of the chart you knock once it doesn't open you retreat you gather some energy and you knock again so the assumption here the 10-year yield should move a little higher if the 10-year moves higher this is good for equities at least for now we're talking about banks the inflationary trade even the nasdaq at least for now the Nasdaq will not start to panic until we see 1.6, 1.7, then we'll have a problem in the Nasdaq. What about the TLT weekly chart? What's going on here? No update at all. Still flirting with 149, back and forth, back and forth, and we will await a resolution here. The assumption here is, in a holiday week, the bulls are gonna win. Seldom when the bears win in a holiday week. The bears, for now, want the TLT to move higher because this panics the market as the yield curve flattens. The bulls want yields to move higher but not by too much and they will get their wish at least this week and then we'll take it from there but perhaps the most important indicator you have to watch is the vix here's the four hours chart for the vix what happened the moment the vix closed the gap below we talked about the gap above in yesterday's video we closed that gap but the vix did not close the gap below well today the vix did that exactly and it did not bounce higher it continued to trade down when you look at the macd indicator this has been a solid reliable indicator every time we have a crossing creating green impressions on the histogram we see a pop of a minimum of double digits in the VIX but that comes hand in hand with a retreat in the SPY and the overall market well now we have a crossing creating negative impressions meaning red impressions on the histogram what does that mean perhaps the pop in the VIX is over for now and this will allow the mini Santa rally to go on yet the bears still have something to hang on here which is the fact that the VIX is still trading above 20 so long as the VIX is trading above 20 the bears are still in control what about Apple a daily chart what's going on here moving higher and now capturing the support of 172. But look at the MACD indicator. Look at the RSI. They have already topped. What does that mean? Sooner or later, Apple will trade down and it will close the gap at 165.32. Moving on to Tesla, the souffle. What's going on here? We talked about a bounce and the bounce took place today. It rebounded from target number one, closing the gap at around 900. A look at the RSI, the MACD, they're all curling higher. So the bounce might not be over yet. Where is the resistance, you might ask? Well, here it is, the top of the breakdown candle around 995. Tesla could rebound higher to revisit 995. And if it reverses from that point on, if you spot a reversal candle, then you can short again. And of course, for the bulls, you can ride all the way to 995. Moving on to tulips, what's going on here in BTC land? I told you I like it and it continues to move higher. We have the saucer bottom. It spent plenty of time there and nobody's sold. Is this bullish or bearish? The answer is 
it's bullish. On top of that, the momentum indicators are getting stronger. I like the setup a lot here in tulips. Lastly, what about AMC? What's going on here? The apes are doing the job. They're buying a lot of calls, moving AMC higher. But at some point, you gotta buy the stock. You cannot just continue to parasite over the market maker buying shares for you. The behavioral element of the chart is clear. They moved higher. They knocked at the resistance of 32. It did not work, at least for now. But this is yet not a rejection candle. For all we know, this is a bull flag formation gathering energy to pop higher above 32. And if the apes close AMC by the end of the week above 32, this will be a major major win now you have to bear in mind that we had a false bull flag before this could be another one but for now you have to take it at face value that amc is gathering energy to pop higher again to give it another shot at knocking 32 as resistance and recapture it as support lastly moving on the conclusion of this video what do we have on the economic calendar tomorrow not a lot we have the consumer confidence index but this is not the important one the important one will come on thursday the university of michigan consumer sentiment index yet tomorrow we also have another important indicator existing home sales we're all watching how the housing market will react to the feds tightening are we about to see dumping of homes pushing prices down will existing home sales let us know that exactly anyhow folks i'm done here this is all i got for you for now thank you for listening thank you for watching and i will talk to you again tomorrow